But today's uh, focus is going to be uh, specifically the sound of silence. That might sound a bit mysterious and strange, but uh, you'll see what I mean very soon as we get into this. So just before we do, let us uh, have a word of prayer to begin. Our Father and our God, Lord, once again, we want to thank you just for this chance to, to delve into your word. Uh, Lord, you know, I believe you've given us your word to inspire, to correct, to guide, to direct, Lord. And we thank you for this marvelous gift. And we pray that, Lord, today will be no different than other times that we have sought you, Lord, that you will help us know you better. That you'll help us appreciate who you are more, especially as we look at this incredible book, Lord, and see what you have done, the marvelous things you have done inside this book. And thank you for the gift of it. Bless us now as we read it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, yeah, friends, the Esther epic. Well, first of all, let's start with uh, the, the introduction to the, the book. Uh, introduces us. Let me just read it for you in Esther chapter one. And I'm going to read the first two verses here. And we're going to be introduced to a fella named Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. Let me just pull it up here. And uh, let's see. It says here, chapter one of Esther. Now, it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. And in those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa. So in those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne. So this Ahasuerus, this is also a fellow named, he's the same guy known in history as King Xerxes. So I just wanted to put that up for you. You can see how long he, he reigned. He's on the throne there for him. But, uh, you know, this is the same king. Now, the, the book starts off by describing this king, Ahasuerus, or King Xerxes, if it's easier to say, to remember. And, and he starts throwing this incredible party, right? Which kind of seems like a strange way to make a start off a book. And the reason this party is so significant is not just because it had some important people at it or because it had some great music at it. But the party itself, technically speaking, was six months long. You heard me right, right? It wasn't just six weeks, six days, six hours, six months long, okay? Very important for us to appreciate this fact. Oh, sorry. And uh, and so and the point is, though, is that as the, as the scriptures go on to read, if you check out chapter one, I'm not gonna, we're gonna go through a lot of chapters today, so we're gonna be kind of summarizing. As you check out chapter one, you find that it gives incredible descriptions of the riches and the splendor of this party and the things they were drinking out of and the, the setting. And it's just opulence and riches everywhere. It's incredible. And this is done for six months with everybody being involved and invited to this party, all these high officials and important people. And, but the question for our purposes is, is why, right? Why might this be the, the setting? What, what's so important about this? Why, why is there so much focus on this huge, massive party with all this great opulence and, 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 and you know, everything being there for people to take partake of? Well, one person put it this way. One, one argument is made in this regard. Historically speaking, it's always important to look at the context. And if we look at the context of what was to proceed or what was actually to follow, we find out that, that right after this, this, this incredible party, that uh, apparently that there was a, a, a plan for the invasion of Greece, right? So this is, this, is the, the, this is the country of Persia. They were planning shortly thereafter to invade the neighboring countries of Greece, right? Which was a formidable foe, a formidable, you know, uh, uh, you know enemy army. And so it's been argued that, you know, this, this, this uh, battle happened not long after. In fact, you might be more familiar with this battle in the same time frame as the movie came out a number of years ago called 300. Right? You might recognize this picture from that kind of frame, 300. And it's famously known in history as the Battle of Thermopylae, right? The Battle of Thermopylae. And in this battle, basically the name is 300 comes from the fact that there were 300 uh, of these, these Greek soldiers who were basically holding down a pass, a, 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 a like a you know like a canyon as it were, and they were keeping back this much larger army of Persia for for you know a huge number uh, for a number of three days straight. These three hundred men were able to hold off an army of tens of thousands. You know they fought ferociously and intelligently, and so it's this same time frame that they were preparing for this kind of battle with, when this party was happening. You might say, well, that's kind of strange. Why would they be throwing a party? Shouldn't soldiers be like, you know, exercising and running through like, you know, drills and marches and, and weapons and such? But here's the thing, right? There's something to notice, there's something for us to notice here. 
the point seems to be more than anything that this party, right, seems to be the idea is to impress, right, to give a grand show, if you will, right, to really make a statement about the greatness of Persia. Right? You think about it. Think about it for a second, right? Who among us, you know, could throw a party for six months? I mean, obviously, the answer is none of us. At least you haven't told me you can throw a party for six months. If you can, talk to me afterwards. I'd be interested to hear that. <laughs> but the point is that most of us couldn't probably throw a party for six hours. You know, we'd be concerned about the food running out or whatnot. It's, it would be a grand thing, you know, a great undertaking. But Persia, right, and therefore specifically King Ahasuerus, is trying to impress the world and impress his country with the fact we have riches abundant. We have more than we could possibly ever, you know, need. we have so much. We are truly a blessed kingdom. We are truly favored of the gods, if you will, right? There, you know, we, we have everything we need. And therefore, it sets a tone for the nation. It says that whatever we want, we can have. Whatever we, we intend to do, we will accomplish. So in, in a sense, you can say it's a fantastic morale booster. It's a fantastic way to boost morale and to get people ready for this, this upcoming war in which they will, you know, let's do this together. We will take on these, these massive other armies and surely we will win because look at us, you know, what a great morale booster. Now I say all this because chapter one ends though, not on a morale boosting note. Right? Chapter one takes a twist, and you're going to find there's a lot of twists in this story. Chapter one ends up, the, the fact that, you know, this may be a morale booster, but in the end, the king calls for his wife, right? You know, Vashti, you may have heard of her. He calls for his wife, and she was apparently quite a beautiful woman, and she's having a separate party of her own with all the ladies, if you will. And he calls for Vashti to come and present herself before him and all of his, his boys, if you will, all of his friends that are hanging out there, and to do a little dance for them, you know, a little parade, whatever, you know, basically, to, you know, he wants to show off, you know, his eye candy. He's like, oh, come and look at my wife, you know. And she, and I'm sure rightly so, and many ladies, I'm sure would not, you know, agree quite readily. She says, no, forget about that. I ain't doing that. No way. You're crazy. Now, for some of us these days, we might be like, well, that's yeah, right. Good for her. Yes, yeah, stand up, girl. Don't be letting boys kind of, you know, treat you like some object. To... But in those days, that kind of thing didn't happen. Right? In those days, the word of the king was seen as absolute, even to his queen. So for her to stand up and say, no, forget that, you could call it a crack in the armor. Right? You call it a crack in the armor, a, a bit of a, a crack in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the actual earth's crust itself. Here we are trying to have a magnificent party. And in fact, the party has even been extended at this point in time. And everything has been going so well. And then the queen herself shows that there's, there's not agreement at the top of the country. The queen herself disobeys the king's commands. The queen herself throws a, 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 a spanner in the works. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? How could this affect our country? Seriously, oh man, it could destroy everything. And so, sadly, as often history has pointed out, this happens, the dissenters must be silenced. Right? The dissenters, those who disagree with the way that powers that be that they want things, they must be stopped. They must be put off the scene. They must be taken care of. They must be dealt with. They must be punished. They must receive a comeuppance. And this is precisely what happens. Precisely what happens. You see, because there's no room in a worldly empire. There's no room for those who are trying to build a, 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 an empire by, by a nation, by power and ingenuity. There's no room for dissent in that context, right? We must be utterly unified. You know? And if you're not on board, then you will be off board. You'll go you're gone, right? And the vision must remain unsullied. The palace must be, uh, the peace, sorry, must be maintained. And thus, Vashti is silenced. She is taken off the scene. She is deposed from her throne. This is the opening scene. This is the opening chapter of, of Revelation, uh, sorry, Revelation, of Esther, of Esther. And so it really sets the tone for what's taking place here. 
And this is important for us, right? We've got to realize this is very important for us because what we're going to see here, friends, is we're going to see a quick uh, overview of the story now and, and some surprising insight into the role that silence, you know, silence actually plays in the book of Esther. Because it, it, it's not just, it, it's not just the, uh, the, the, the Vashti who is silent. You'll see other aspects of silence, quite surprising in the story. And we'll see them in quick succession here. So bear with me. Here we go. Oh, sorry, my mouse is playing up. There we go. Well, let's look at Esther chapter two. Right in Esther chapter two, one of the primary verses there it says Esther, after she is relic, you know, she is uh, brought in and she becomes queen. There's a beauty contest, and Esther gets to be gets the most votes, shall we say, the vote that counts. She gets the king's vote. But interestingly, it says here in chapter two that Esther did not make known her people or her kindred for Mordecai. That's her, her, uh, you know, basically her guardian you know, her uncle, if you will, uh, he had instructed her that she should not make them known. So what Esther does is she does not say anything about the fact that she is a Jew, that she is a God follower. She doesn't tell her husband, <laughs> right? The king, the most important person in this, on this, this kingdom. She doesn't tell him what her faith is. In fact, she doesn't tell anybody what her faith is because her uncle said, shh, keep it on the down low which is rather strange, wouldn't you say? Are we supposed to keep quiet when it comes to our faith? Are we supposed to keep it on the down low? Why would someone do that? But we'll find out. We'll find out. Let's, 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 let's kind of get a feel for the story, but let's keep this in mind, right? Is that it, it, it's, it's her uncle, also a faithful Jew, who doesn't want her to spread her faith. But maybe there's a reason for this. Let's find out. Esther chapter 3. Right in this story, in, in chapter three, we get introduced to this fellow named Haman, and Haman is, is described as an Agagite. You know, and, and basically, if you trace it back into history, this is an ancient enemy of the Jews, and uh, and this Haman though quickly arises in the ranks of, of of the political kingdom, and he becomes the prime minister essentially. You know, he's given lots of power and and ability, and and as he begins to uh, you know rise in the in the power, he encounters Mordecai the Jew. And Mordecai, knowing, you know, what Haman is like, probably both in character and in history, refuses to bow down to him, you know, perhaps for religious reasons, as well as perhaps just for pride reasons. He's like, I ain't bound to this guy. Although everyone's saying, Mordecai, bow to this, bow to this guy. And uh, Haman notices that this Jew is not bowing to him. And when he finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, he decides not only to try to take, you know, uh, vengeance on Mordecai, but also on all of his people, right? If you're going to take someone down, why not take them down big time? That's Haman's attitude. Let's get rid of all of them. And so Haman proposes a plot to the king, right? In which he describes to the king a people who really aren't obedient to the king's ways, who aren't in harmony with the king's laws and the, and the nations and the way the nation, and, and he proposes to the king, right? That, that we should really do something about this. We, in fact, king, let me, I, I don't want to bother you, king, let me take care of this problem for you. I will even pay for them to be purged from the system. I'll, I'll put money of my own money into the treasury so that this can be taken care of. And the king's, oh, no, Haman, come on now. That's not worth, no, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll sign the document. You just take care of business. I, I trust you completely. What's interesting about this whole, you know, sort of dialogue, Haman never once mentions that it's the Jews he's trying to destroy. He, he keeps silent about it, who exactly he wants to destroy. Sh shrouded in mystery, shall we say. He never once mentions their name. But the deed is done. The death warrant is signed on the Jews. They are to die essentially a little less than one year from that point in time. The countdown of terror begins. Not fun. Not, not you know, what's going to happen? This is Esther chapter three. Now, chapter four, right? Of course, Mordecai, when he finds out about this, you know, and, and, and Queen Esther herself, she's not really in the know at this point in time. So Mordecai ends up sending a message to her to let her know, hey, you know, you need to go in before the king. You need to try to save your people. You need to do something to correct this situation. Otherwise, we're all going to die. And Esther starts bantering with him back and forth and say, well, I can't go in there. You know the laws of the land. If I go in before the king, he could have my head. He hasn't asked me to come in. And you know, that's the law of the land. He has to ask you to come in. You have to be booked in. Otherwise, you could die. If he doesn't want to see you. It could be curtains. And Mordecai says, look it. You know, you need to recognize, you know, that this could be the time why God has called you to be here at this time, to put you in as queen, to save your people. Esther, you've got to step up to the plate. You've got to step up. 
And so as Esther thinks on this, she sends a reply back. And this is where it gets interesting. She sends a reply back to Mordecai and she says, right, have the people, right? Have, our, have the Jewish people fast, right? And I and my maidens will also fast, right? You know, and, and, and she says, well, we'll do this. But it's interesting that she doesn't, she just says fasting. She never says the, the usual accompaniment, praying. Right? There's no mention of anything religious here. That these faith markers are absent in, in her in her uh, in, in her request. Right? There's just the sound of silence in their place. But she says, let's 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 fast, let's not eat, let's 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 focus ourselves, let's really maybe hope for the best. But it's interesting, there's no specific mention of the word prayer here or anything. Very strange. But let's move on and see how the story goes. Now, in chapter five, uh, Esther comes up with a plan. She goes before the king, and by the God's grace, she indeed, her life is spared. The king is actually quite happy to see her, but I think he's a bit mystified too. Why is Esther here? What in the world? And, and she comes before him, and she then she asks, having placed her life on the line to come and see him, she asks of all things that she could have asked for, for him to come to dinner, to have just come to a special dinner that she wants to throw him, which must really mystify the king, because he's thinking, why would she put her life on the line just to ask me to come for roast beef and mashed potatoes, you know, so to speak? What? You know, but she does also include, uh, almost innocuously, she includes a request for Haman to be brought to the banquet as well. So it's just going to be the three of them, Queen Esther, Haman, and Ahasuerus, the king. But she never tells the two of them why she has done so, right? It's very interesting. And not only does she not tell them why she's done so, when she gets to the banquet, she invites them again to a second banquet at which she says she will tell them why she's actually done so, but she keeps this quiet. It's the sound of silence again in the story, you could argue. <clears throat> For our final chapter today, there's, there's 10 chapters in Esther. We're gonna look at the first six here really quickly. Now, um, <laughs> this, this is the turnaround chapter of the book. You know, the king, it says, couldn't sleep that particular night. And, and of course, you know, he's trying to wrestle with what's going to be happening you know, in the future. And, and he's trying to get to sleep and he has someone read to him the chronicles of, of what has happened in the kingdom. And he finds out that in the chronicles of the kingdom that Mordecai, uh, Esther's uncle, you know, had previously actually saved his life. And he said, what, what has been done for this man who previously saved my life? And the, and the scribe looks through and says, oh, well, actually nothing was ever done for this fella. And the king's like, what? And he's like, we need to do something for this guy. Meanwhile, what had happened the night before, after Haman had left the banquet the night before, was he'd been walking home. And again, he had bumped into Mordecai. He saw Mordecai on the side of the road there. And Mordecai once again refused to give obeisance to him, to, to, to fall down and, you know, kiss his royal robe or feet or whatever the case might be. And Haman was just furious. He's like, here I am. I'm on the top of the world. And this, this, this stupid Jew won't worship me. Oh, you know, he just can't. He's so frustrated. He goes home and complains to his wife and his friends. And, he, and then finally they say, well, why don't you just get the guy killed? Set up. A, you're, the, you're the man. You're the, you're the prime minister. Set up a gallows and have him hung or, you know, just get rid of the fella. And he was like, yeah, it's true. Why don't I? And so he has the thing constructed in his yard, basically, and gets ready to, you know, ha have Mordecai done away with the next day. So it's the next day, the king is, like I said, looking at these, thinking about what can I do for Mordecai as he's reviewing it that very night. And, and Mordecai and, and Haman walks in that morning to ask for, <laughs> of course, Mordecai's life. And the king asks him a series of questions about what should the king do if, uh, you know, he wanted to do something for the person who really pleases him. And Haman's like, oh, well, and he's thinking purely of himself, of course. And Haman's like, well, if you really wanted to, you know, bless the person who has been a blessing to you, uh, you know, to have him wear your royal robe and, and parade him around the city on a royal horse and have your most important official saying, this is what the man that the king loves will have done to him. And, and of course, the king speak, speaks those fateful words because he never actually tells Haman who it was for until that very moment. He says, right, go and do that for Mordecai the Jew. You be the man who leads him around. Go ahead, Haman. I trust you. Take care of business. And Haman, of course, is blown away. He's like, Oh, this ain't good. This is bad news. The king never actually said who he was thinking of until the very, very end. Sound of silence. And it's fascinating, friends, because this is what keeps happening throughout the book, right? This is I, I point these things out to you because you know this this is this is significant. This is very significant, you know. 
that the story it ends on a series of seemingly coincidental events, you know, with Esther and her people being spared from the genocidal uh, 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 leanings of vengeance, you know, from this power monger fella, Haman, you know, and, and that, of course, in the end, that same killer of the Jews, potential killer of the Jews, he ends up getting his comeuppance. He ends up dying on his own gallows, you know. But he, here's the reason, though, I bring this up. There's a, there's a bit of an elephant in the room, as they say. You know, there's a bit of an elephant in the room. You know, why is it that we've taken such pains today to, to notice all of this focus on silence in the book of Esther? I mean, isn't it a bit much? Uh, isn't this kind of, you know, sounds more like a, a literature analysis class. You know, am I in English class here again, studying more than a sermon? How is this supposed to be of help to anyone? You know, exactly. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, these are good questions. And hopefully we're going to see the answer fairly soon, you know, and clearly by the end of our talk today. But let, let me point out a few things before we actually get there to that thrust. Why are we looking at this today? Well, first of all, let's look at some contemporary parallels, right? So some, some current, you know, examples of how these characters are acting, right? What I personally find so amazing about this story in, in a lot of ways in, in, is that is the genius of it, right? This absolute genius. This tale lends itself to our lives in a way that we are well able to relate to, you know, since the protagonists in the story, Esther and Mordecai, right? Like so many of us today in the Western world, especially, and check this out. This is very important, right? We may be religious in name, right? I'm a God follower. Oh, I am too. Oh, me too. Okay. I'm religious in name, but oftentimes it may be that our religious practice is questionable. Right? Our religious actions are, are even perhaps missing. They're, 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 they're kept in silence. They're, they're, they're somehow disappeared, right? The day-to-day -day living of that same faith that we profess. And for some reason, Esther and Mordecai, as we saw earlier, they chose to keep their faith silent, on the down low, out of sight, where it's not going to seemingly maybe bother too much, you know? And it makes you question, as again, in our own lives, why did they do it? But then what's our reasons? What are our reasons for doing so? For those of us who maybe struggle with this at times, why do we sometimes hide our faith? Why is there sometimes the sound of silence where the sound of faith should be? Something for us to think about. Really, really. You know, it's been pointed out uh, too by this time in history that Mordecai and Esther Right? Uh, as well as a number of the other Jews that were living in that city and in that country, they would have had an opportunity to return to Jerusalem by this time. Let me show what I'm talking about. This is a quote from a book called Behind the Scene about the book of Esther by a, a, a professor and pastor named uh, Larry Lichtenwalter. Check out what he says here. He says, the crisis in Esther partly resulted from the fact that God's people did not take advantage of the opportunity to leave Babylon and return to Jerusalem during more favorable times. Not on one, on two occasions, God graciously opened the way for his people to go back to Jerusalem. In the time of Cyrus, only about 50,000 or so of the hundreds of thousands of captives, Jews, returned. The great majority of God's people, they chose to remain in the land of their exile, rather than undergo the hardships of the return journey and the reestablishment of their desolated cities and homes. In other words, friends, they chose the life of comfort because to go back would have meant a great deal of upheaval, transformation, change, and work. So they chose the easier option. Let's just stay here. The same thing happened when Darius issued a second decree for the Jews in the Medo-Persian realm to return to the land of their fathers. During that opportunity, the prophet Zechariah, this is a biblical prophet, right? He pleaded with the exiles to return, but to no avail. And this is what he said. Ho there, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. For I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Ho, Zion, escape, you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. This is Zechariah chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. The thing is, they just weren't interested. As Ronald Pierce writes, many had forgotten their calling to separateness and had chosen to compromise their heritage for the sake of personal advancement. 
Right? They were probably doing quite well in their businesses and their homes and the kids going to university. And, you know, they were probably up and coming, you know, in their, in their local areas. And, you know, the story of Esther then, friends, is a narrative of marginal faith, whether it's faith on the edge, faith on the far flung edges, or at best, floundering faith, faith that is struggling to stay alive. It is a faith, perhaps, that is more a fact of birth. I inherited this because who I was born to than a religious conviction. It is a faith evaded and hidden. I highlight this, friends, because it's important for us to recognize the context in which this story is said. It's, it's always so important, friends, to get context for our stories. I need you to understand of how God's people were struggling at this time. They weren't struggling with oppression, friends. They were at the opposite end of the spectrum. They were struggling with glamour and wealth and, and positive things, you know, opportunities, abundance, ease, a life of, you know, goodness. They were struggling with the pleasures and the calls to, you know, advancement and such. This is the context in which we read the story of Esther. If you remember, even the, the way the story began, we saw the opulence there. It was unbelievable, right? How much uh, wealth was in this kingdom at that time. That just gives us a feel. I mean, this is coming from the king's perspective, but I'm sure that, you know, these things trickle down. There's a trickle down effect. And the kingdom would be displaying these things. In fact, let me look at the next one, right? The, the, like we said, you know, the, the Persia was loaded, okay? <laughs> to put it simply, Persia was loaded. It's all about material prosperity in the here and now. Maybe that sounds familiar. Do you remember, remember the story in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, right? Verses 8 to 11. Specifically, it's a story where we look at the life of Jesus Christ. And the story has Jesus in the wilderness. And he was struggling. But someone comes along in that story and offers Jesus an out. In fact, the, uh, the offer is made by the devil himself. He says, Jesus, you don't have to struggle, man. You don't have to struggle. I can make this easy for you. All you got to do is bow down. I'll give you everything you want. It's all there. It's all there. Just bow down. Just kiss the hem of my robe. Just acknowledge that, you know, I, my ways are superior. Don't fight. Just give in. Just give in. That's all you got to do, Jesus. Just give in. The evil one, friends, still offers his wares to whomever will listen. You know, thankfully, Jesus showed they can be resisted, but it is going to be a struggle. So this is the context, friends, the context for the silence that we're seeing in the book of Esther. The likely reasons for that silence, you know, in many cases, you know, especially from Esther and Mordecai's point of view. And these should cause us to pause and to reflect upon the silence that, that may happen in our lives when it comes to spiritual things, our very faith itself. How are we responding? What may be impinging upon our faith reactions? Have we been compromised in some way? You know, we need to check this personally. I'm not pointing fingers at you. I'm saying, let me check myself personally. I am the, I am the master of my, my destiny. I am the captain of my life's ship, if you will. And so are you. You are the captain of your ship. What course are you headed on? What course are you, are you now on? Are we being led down that same materialistic uh, path, loving path? Are we getting caught up in the wealth and the wonder of our world to the detriment of our faith, to the death of our faith? Right? It can happen, as we have been seeing already in Esther's story. It happens to people of faith. It really does. Let me just show you a few other things, friends, because there are other things. I, we need to get to this. We still haven't gotten to the heart of the question here, right? There are many issues that are afoot here in the book of Esther. But what is it really trying to get across to us? What is one of the main points? And this is, I'd like to show you something, a little argument here. Right? We see in this book warfare along racial lines. But is the story really about that? We see sexism in this book. But is the story really about that? We see blatant genocidal intentions. Get rid of all those Jews, right? Barely given a moment's notice by those in leadership. That's terrible. But is the story really just, is it just about that? People's faith here is almost seemingly non-existent. But is that what the story is really about? 
corrupt and wind benumbed leadership in place. But is that what the story is really about? People who are scheming to get ahead, figuring it out by themselves with no reference or regard for heaven and what it might wish. But is the story really about that? On the positive side, I mean, we see that it's good to have people in power whom you know you can trust. Or can you? But is the story really about that? We do see in the end, yes, evil gets its comeuppance, right? It gets paid back. Indeed. But is the story just really about that? Is this merely a moral tale? Is it just some historical fiction just to you know, while away your time, kind of to amuse you for a time? These are important questions. What is the book of Esther really about? How do we know? I would like to argue, friends, that the sheer number of seeming coincidence coming together at just the right time in just the right way makes the story indeed the classic that it is. But it also begs the question, was it all just random? Was it really just accidental, just a nice coincidence, just a cool story for that purpose. I think there's something much deeper going on here, and I'd like to share that with you today. All right? Check this out. Right? In this book, right? There's, I believe there's a teasing for us to go deeper. And Lichtenwalter weighs in again. He says, nowhere does the book mention God. Now, I need to pause there. I'm not sure if some of you have recognized this before. You may have read the story of Esther, but did you ever think about the fact the book of Esther never once mentions God. Did you know that? It doesn't even mention a hint of him in any of its 10 chapters. The narrative itself, right? It mentions the Persian king 190 times in 167 verses, but God, not once, not once. This lack of any explicit reference to God in the story of Esther seems to be deliberate. There's not even a mention of temple. There's not a mention of prayer, nothing, right? The disturbing shift from God to human ingenuity and power, it gives this impression that life's events and their results are ultimately under the control of resourceful human beings. That we are the ones who shape and modify our lives and determine the course of history. In other words, it's up to us. It's our ingenuity that our intelligence, our power that turns things around. On the surface, Esther seems actually humanistic. It seems to be projecting a kind of do-it-yourself approach to life on the face of it, on the face of it. But is it really? You know, is it really just random, friends? Or could it be that we are to look at this book and recognize there's something happening behind the scene? You know, there's something more here going on, right? That, that God, could God be working in such a setting right? Where effectively God seems to be entirely invisible. God seems to be inaudible, right? Throughout the whole plot. You know, I believe that the answer, friends, is a definite and intentional yes, right? But this is all very purposed, right? God has allowed this book in, 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 in his word for a reason, you know? The genius of this story, it lays in the way that it, it arguably conveys the picture of a God who is guiding behind the curtain of life, right? And, and yet never once does he have to be given official credit for it. I raise this, friends, because once again, I'd like to point out, you and I live in a context, especially living in Britain, that is known as a secular society. Some people call it a post-Christian society. In other words, we, Christianity is something in our rearview mirror. It's in the past. We are now moving into a different phase of life. Why talk about God? Why bother with God? Who is this God? We can take care of business ourselves. That's the general attitude. So think about that. How does God speak to people in a context like that? How is God going to get through to people in a context like that, especially when his own people, perhaps, are keeping faith under wraps in silence? What's God going to do? What are his options? Won't the gospel fall down and be crushed and come to nothing? Well, I have good news for you. No, the answer is no. God has never, ever left short, friends. You know, a wise woman once said that he has a thousand and one ways in which he can accomplish his purposes. And that's just, that's, 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 that's a minor way of saying it. 
I'm sure he has a billion and one ways of accomplishing all of his purposes. We need to recognize something, you know, the scriptures remind us of this and not just in the story of Esther. Let me show you a couple other places here. Show you a couple other places. You ever heard this Psalm before? Psalm 19? Let's revisit this as we look at it, right? This is from the New Living Translation. The first three verses say this. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. Interestingly enough, it goes on to say they speak without a sound or a word. Their voices never heard. So they speak without speaking, but they testify to the glory of God. But, you know, the scriptures don't stop there. There's another verse in the Bible you may have heard. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 is also quite a famous verse. Paul, the apostle Paul, he said this, For since the creation of the world, his, God's, invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived being understood by what has been made so that they, the people out there, are without excuse. You see, friends, the world around us speaks to us of the presence of God, even when words are sometimes not being used. Even when there's the sound of silence, God is still speaking. God is still being heard. His presence is still being felt. And Esther's book is no exception to that rule, if you will. No exception to that rule. The question is, who is paying attention? Right? Are we? Are we paying attention? Are we looking to hear what these, these uh, clues God has left behind are trying to say? I believe the same thing applies to you know, the, this, this picture here. right? This, this picture that we're looking at, friends, in the book of Esther, it, it is not uh, meant to be just appreciated for what it is, right? A clever literary, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, story, incredibly clever, but it's meant to be appreciated for what it points toward, right? What it points at. And that is, friends, even in silence, God is magnified. It's amazing, right? You, we can think of it as a fault sometimes, but God leaves nothing to, 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 hit, to chance. Even in silence, his name can be magnified. Even in the quiet moments, God is still there, ruling and guiding and leading and loving. And I am just amazed by this. It awes me. You know, even when his people, even when we forget, and it does happen, sadly, even when we get caught up in, the, in, in our own schemes and our own plans, uh, the riches and the temptations of this world, as they often play right into Satan's wicked hand, the Almighty, praise God, does not abandon nor forsake us, friends. I'm not saying we should play with this fast and loose, no. But his grace continues to be given despite our foolishness. His patience is so long-suffering. I'm amazed. God continues to work out his will and to demonstrate his amazing grace toward us. <clears throat> and I, again, I must highlight this. I believe especially, friends, we should appreciate this for those of us who are living in the secularized Western world. You know, because faith here can often be kept on the back burner. Faith is often seen as something, you know, kept on the down low. Uh, it, we may not talk about it much with our, our secular compadres, you know, our workmates, people that we work with at school or, or, you know, we may not, we may even forget to reference it in our own lives from day to day. Uh, sometimes we can get so used to just carrying our lives in the, in the same old fashion, we act, even act like there's no God. It shouldn't be that way, we know, but it happens. Let's be real about it. To address the situation, you must first recognize the situation. Let's recognize it so we can start addressing it you know, in our own lives. And we can understand, maybe sometimes too, because of our lack of faith, the troubles seem to increase dramatically. Sometimes we are feeling overwhelmed by the fact, maybe we feel like maybe God has abandoned us. Maybe he's forgotten us in his anger. Maybe he said, oh, forget you. You, you know, you're no good at this thing. And that's when these stories remind us of God's grace, you know, even when we are quiet, maybe when he even seems to be quiet, he's still there working out his plans. So the next time, friends, that you read Esther or even any other part of his word, but especially Esther, where the sound of silence seems to reign so supreme in so many ways, including God himself. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to remember that all is not necessarily as it seems. 
Remember that God is still there working behind it all, working out his perfect will. Remember that even when people are struggling to get it right, you know, oh, you know, he is still being true to who he is. And that's the great news, friends. And I want to encourage you to remember to listen for his still small voice. I want to remember to listen for that telltale sound of silence and remember what it actually entails. As we close today, I'm going to share with you a, 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 a quote I came across, and I think it really summarizes well what we're talking about here today. So Ellen, Ellen White from the book Education, she said this, in the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, they appear as, as dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, his ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, sorry, and behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently, working out the counsels of his own will. May God bless you as you take this reminder, and may it encourage you in your walk, as we seek to bring our lives before God and say, Lord, teach me how to speak when I ought to. Teach me how to trust you in the silence that is all around me. Even when I'm struggling, Lord, help me to remember your faithfulness. May God bless you to this end. Amen. Mm -hmm.